Hello and welcome to the first of our Airport Safety Week 2019 webinars. If you require any technical assistance, please phone Redback Support on 1800 733 416. This number is also listed at the bottom of the live webinar page. If you would like to listen to this webinar through your phone instead, please dial in the number and passcode in the grey bar below. Today the AAA presents planning for a successful airport emergency exercise. This webinar will look at stakeholder engagement, developing an exercise plan, and risk mitigation. The opportunity to ask questions will also be provided. To ask Jill a question, please use the Navy hand icon on the top right hand side of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. You can access the resources for this presentation in the light blue icon with the downwards arrow in the top right of your page. Before we start, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Jill for her time today and also in preparing for this webinar. I would also like to take this opportunity to provide you with a couple of updates from the AAA. Airport Safety Week 2019 launched yesterday and continues until Friday. There are some great initiatives taking place throughout the week. Make sure you visit the website to download the latest resources. Register your email to enter our daily quiz and win education mm -hmm. courses and vouchers. Follow the AAA on social media to take part in the Airport Photo of the Day competition and share your images and videos using hashtag ASW2019. And enter our competitions to win an FOD bus or five iPads for your airport. The AAA National Conference is also only five weeks away. The four-day comprehensive program incorporates both a technical and regional stream and includes plenary sessions, panel discussions, and case studies covering topics from customer and passenger experiences, airports and climate change, airport governance, innovation and technology to safety and emergency management, as well as updates from CASA. Without any further ado, let's begin the webinar. Hello everyone. Airport personnel are charged with ensuring effective business continuity, disaster recovery and emergency management plans. Conducting an ineffective exercise constitutes a lost opportunity. Running an emergency exercise can be time consuming, entailing an extensive cost in large measure in manpower hours. Given the large investment, it is important to design and run an exercise to get the best possible outcome. Understanding that those listening to the webinar respond to incidents as part of your role, so no pressure really, and thank you very much for joining me today. Here are my tips on what has worked for me and for others that I've worked with for planning a successful exercise. Today I'll cover four areas. Regulatory framework, stakeholder engagement, developing an emergency exercise plan, and risk mitigation. Each topic is worthy of their own webinar, so I'm only covering the topics broadly and have provided additional reference material. So the regulatory framework. Now I've provided a large chart, and I've broken every PowerPoint rule with the number of words on this document, but it shows you the key regulatory documents. Now it's a matrix showing you what's regulatory on the international is on the left and our national requirements are on the right. The supportive document sits beneath the regulatory framework. I've provided these and some of these um, have been included in your reference material. So on the left with the international standard, the overriding documents for civil aviation around the world are the ICAO annexes. And these form the basis of each country's national safety aviation legislation. And for this example in Australia, it's our CAFTA 1988. And ICAO also produced a series of airport services manuals to assist airports with the implementation of those annexes. So I've provided some of those examples, some which are um, available, and if you don't have them, you can contact me as well. Um, but they're great examples to start looking at how do you run an exercise. They provide a lot of tips in those manuals. On the right hand side, with the national regulation, 
I also want to look to think that there's just more than just the CASA requirements. And I've listed a number of those and we'll go through a few of those today. And there's also some fantastic material out there that's available. Um, one is the Australian Government Aviation Disaster Response Plan, which I'll ask you a question about that soon. There's also workplace health safety legislation and there's one right down the very bottom which I um, unfortunately didn't put uh, spell out in full. It's ICCS plus and that stands for Incident Command and Control System. So this one is designed police, uh, for police and is used by the police. But it's also being used in the mining industry and at Sydney Airport. And one that I've used in the reference material because I think this is um, a way that the future is going to be in Australia. So on the next one, I look at uh, workplace health and safety, acts and regulations. I really want to take home to the point that it's not just the CASA regs that you must look at. So I've used a Queensland example. Um, and every state and territory has very similar OHS legislation. But I've used this one to look at the key things that you must comply with under the OHS regs. So you must have an effective response to emergency. You have to have information and training and instruction to relevant workers in relation to implementing your emergency procedures. And when I look at the risk management point of view at the end of today, you also need to look at the nature of the hazards at the workplace. And now this includes the hazards that relate um, when you're running an emergency exercise. Then there's some supporting documents. And in Australia, we have our Australian New Zealand standards and we also comply with international standards. So the ones that I've uh, used as examples are the Australian Standards uh, 4801, 2001, the OHS Management System. And there's also an international standard that relates to this as well. And you must have train and have competency checks. So the organisation in consultation with employees shall identify training needs in relation to performing work activities competently. Now you can cover this in your emergency exercises by training personnel and you can also assess their competency in doing those procedures. And if you have an environment management system, you're also required to have an emergency preparedness and response. And under this standard, you will be periodically testing your plan response and actions and provide relevant information and training related to the emergency preparedness and response. So you can tick the box in a number of areas when you run an emergency exercise. You can put that to your OHS committee. If you've got an EMS, this will satisfy the needs uh, for your environment management system. And also you'll cover off the next page, which is the CASA requirements. So what I've looked at is what the new uh, MOS looks like, rather than the current one. Everyone is accustomed to that one. So this one will be implemented in August 2020. No doubt everyone has been absolutely looking through the legislation. But I just want to go through this one, um, some key things on this one. So if you do have an emergency management plan, or if you're a registered aerodrome going to a certified one and you're developing your plans, you must have the exercises in a scaled up version. So to run a full field exercise, you therefore have uh, two years and nine months to facilitate a full field emergency exercise. But you can gradually build up to that. And in this aspect, it covers off very well and looks at really coincides with our current AIMS system. Now this is um, a document that I've put in one of your reference material and I'll come to that a little bit later. Um, but it definitely looks at you crawl, walk, run and then fly. And exercises come in many forms and styles and sizes that allow an airport to obtain either a snapshot overview or a more substantial analysis of performance in terms of both business capability and capacity to respond to an incident. Now the new MOS requirements fit nicely into this framework. So you'll be crawling, walking, running and flying. So in the crawl aspect, 
You'll be looking at becoming familiar with your procedures and processes, um, getting to meet the people. You will then start drilling some aspects of that. And then you can start running. And, and I do believe tabletops, you're running by then because they take a significant work effort to run a tabletop and also a full field exercise. Once you're flying, you can start doing multi-sites, more than one location. And the Adelaide Airport has recently done an exercise where they had two sites that they had to respond to. Now they're also, you know, they have a lot of people involved and they're at that stage of flying. So I'll take you back to crawling. Starting at the crawl stage, and this stage is about engagement. Getting to know the people involved, what procedures, plans, protocols you have in place, and what equipment and facilities you have to respond to an incident. And the key to success is people. And establishing relationships is 90% of pre-incident planning. Now I've got this quote from Gavin Freeman. He's the Deputy Chief Officer of the Country Fire Authority in Victoria. And I thought it was quite relevant with our current fire season. So these guys pretty much get to know each other before they have an incident, to make sure that they know who's who in the zoo and to make sure who's going to respond and where and something that we can do for at airports. So your stakeholder engagement. The do's and don'ts. Get all your departments and sections involved. A lot of the time airports operate um, in silos and just get their operations team to develop and run the exercise. But many parts, your reception is going to be actually hammered in a real incident. Make sure they're involved. And make sure your other departments, your electrical departments, anyone who's going to be actually involved in generally in an incident, most of your team will be involved. So get those involved in the exercise. Engage with external stakeholders and anyone who'd be involved during the real incident. And don't just make it an airport only exercise unless you're drilling for one particular thing. Get the media involved. A lot of people think the media are the enemy. But in fact, if you work well with them well in advance, they'll get to know you and what their limitations are as well. Use available training. Um, the fire service can do, offer some great training and awareness for people. And so don't just think that um, not to ask for training. The answer might always be yes. And the key part is site familiarisation. Don't assume that everyone knows where your facilities are. If you've done any development, if you've changed your gates, anything like that, that can be quite confusing for people. When not done right, and Reggie, I see you online, you might notice this picture. <laughs> Responding agencies don't know who to contact at the airport. Commanders arriving at the scene take too long or don't contact commanders from other services at the airport. And this leads to poor information sharing, lack of communication, and no joint understanding of the unfolding emergency. So you might be just left out in the airfield by themselves. Now this is well understood in the UK where they found that they were having issues with interoperability. Now understanding that this is not an Australian standard, but I did find it's a good reference tool to use in Australia and how we can improve interoperability and so I've included this as a reference tool for you to use. The aim of this Jessup is to help our emergency services save more lives when we experience major and complex incidents by working together. Jessup has introduced a national standard to multi-agency joints of working in the UK. And when it's used every day by responders, the emergency services will be able to provide a consistent joint emergency response to incidents wherever the incident may take place across the country. So the primary goal of the JEP is to have a fundamentally ingrained culture of interoperability working. Now this is something that we want at an airport, to have everyone understanding that when they come to the airport, it's a culture that we have, everyone works together. And working together saves lives. Now I'll go back to Gavin Freeman. He's used a good quote as saying complex planning and exercising 
while vitally important, cannot be undertaken at the expense of some of the more traditional practices, such as routine site familiarisations. And he understands this well. Um, I've used this quote from a book called Incident Management in Australasia. A good tip as well, it's a good one to use if you want to look more at incident management. And he was responding to a fire at the Mayan Centre in Hobart. So why sites and mills? Firstly, firstly, they're going to improve your response to an incident. Uh, people will be more aware of the airport and the facilities. And it'll match what's in your aerodrome emergency plan to what's reality. And there'll also be, if you've had any changes due to construction, that people will be aware of what those changes have been. Okay, we're back. Can you please put up the poll? I'm not too sure if everyone can see the poll. Um, I'm going to ask a question. How often does your airport conduct airport for mills? And you can answer either half yearly, annually, only when conducting an exercise, or never. Okay, so a large proportion of people only put up when conducting an exercise. And then the next one was annually. So this is an area we'd like to improve. Um, so once a year, um, it, it really does depend on your site. So going back to the presentation, I'll look at some of the things that you can include in your site for mill. Firstly, making sure that people understand where to access the airport, your vehicle reporting point. Uh, and sometimes there's changes in your plans, just make, but making sure that people have access. This is done well, I have to say, one of the things uh, at Groot Island where people were actually trained to drive airside as well. So that was very good training and engagement. Also understanding where your emergency operations centre is. For some airports, it's actually not on the airport, and I'll use Ballina as an example, where they use the landfill facility next door to the airport. So making sure that if the emergency responders go out to the airport, they have to understand that they'll be moved back to a different location. Also look at your passenger and relative reception centres. Again, sometimes they're not always on airport or used in your terminal. Or if they are, you have to make sure that uh, those reception centres are available and that people know where to go to. Also make sure you have a facility for your media centre and so people know that they need to go to that location. And any key facility on or out the airport that emergency responders need to access, including your security systems, your first aid rooms, anything like that. So if you do have a security incident, you wanna make sure that the police are aware of where your facilities are to look at that. Do you look at your CCTV in a different room? Do you look at that in a separate building? Make sure that you show that location to them. And a really good one is to make sure that you look at your environmental site conditions or for people to understand what those site conditions are. Your prevailing wind conditions. Especially a lot of people just completely forget that you have a really good indicator out there in your windsock. Show them that location, show them and tell them and include sometimes in your exercise plan what direction the wind is normally coming from. That way they can plan well in advance of the impact if they have an incident, where the wind and where that will flow to, you know, and uh, how they're going to manage anything that's off airport. Importantly, your drainage flow and protection and the direction of that flow. So if you still have a spill on your apron and it goes in one direction, but your responders actually think it's been going in another direction, you will have them responding to the wrong area. And unfortunately, that has happened. Make sure that they're aware of where your fume scepters are, your interceptor traps, and how your fuel traps work. So if you're a larger airport, some airports have fuel traps, and you actually don't want to cover that drain. You want the fuel to go into that drain so it can go to your fume scepter. So that's a key one to make sure, because not only will you have that incident to respond to, 
but if you have fuel flowing or anything else flowing into your drain, such as PFAS or any other type of chemical product, you will have an ongoing incident and can move along in on your airport grounds. Then it, they will be moving to sometimes your significant areas. So have, if you've got any freshwater systems, um, creeks, a lot of the airports are right next to waterways, make sure that people are aware that this will, what drain will enter into that system. And also any uh, key vegetation that you need protecting. And then pre get them to press the flesh. Get your emergency services out, get them to know um, who your stakeholders are. Don't forget your after hours security contractors because no doubt you will have those people working day and night as well. Um, and it's good to know who they are. Um, and it's good to know the emergency responders know who they are. And another tip is meet your crane operators. A lot of people know that they've got them in their plan that if you have an aircraft accident and you'll need a crane or a truck or a facility to come and get that aircraft off there, make sure that you're you know them and that they will be available when you really need them. And the best time to make friends is before you need them. I think this is uh, one of my favourite expressions. So now I go into developing an exercise plan. Um, and I really want you to think about this in a different mindset, that you're not planning for an exercise but planning and exercising to respond to an incident. Now I've got the framework on the right and the first thing that you do is identify the need of what the type of exercise you need. You analyse that need generally with your whole committee. You plan the exercise, conduct the exercise, debrief the exercise and then you evaluate that exercise which then takes you back to the start of usually in those exercise reports, you'll have some recommendations which will then identify your next need for an exercise. Now firstly, how do you identify that need? Now I've used the diagram on the left that you can look at three things that will really identify what, what you need to include or why you're going to do a particular exercise. You're going to look at your vulnerabilities. Uh, you may have some security issues that you really want to tell people to get those fixed if you don't have a fence that's fully around your facility um, and that you're making you vulnerable. Um, you have some hazards or threats that you're aware of and that you would like to need to make sure that you can respond to those if they eventuate. And you also have to look at your capability. If you're a long way out from uh, a township, and you might know that, okay, it might take 15 minutes for a responder to get out to the, to the site. You need to exercise those to see how best your people on airport can manage that issue prior to um, emergency responders coming out. So I've also given you another reference tool which I find quite a handy document. Now, it is the Inspector General's Emergency Management Prioritisation Tool. Now, it is a Queensland uh, Government document, but it's a really good one to look at what your capability is and what your emergency, cap uh, emergency responders' capability is. So you can pretty quickly go through those online and mark out what your hazards are, how you're prepared to deal with these things, the response that's available and any relief and recovery. And it's important to always think about recovery. Now the next slide is actually getting into the nuts and bolts of an exercise plan. Now I have covered the majority of the aspects. There are some areas that um, I haven't included everything, but I've written some notes that you may want to write down some things as well. But I've provided one of the best reference material and is that and that's Handbook 3, um, Managing Exercises from the Australian Government Attorney General's Department. Now, and the, the presentation I'm doing pretty much goes through the outlines that, um, the outline of an exercise plan from that handbook. So firstly, you need to analyse the need and plan the exercise. So as a company, you've already identified what need you have. 
But then you sit down with your exercise planning committee or your uh, AEP committee and look at analysing that need and then start to plan the exercise. So I haven't put too much in here about uh, your exercise planning committee. I think that's a given that you have to get other people in the room to manage an exercise. So the first thing that you need to look at is writing down your needs. Then you set your aim, objectives, um, and making sure that those objectives are measurable. Um, you also need to include your responding agencies. Now that is also outlined in the CASA advisory circular that you have to have objectives for your responding agency. You also need to determine, uh, determine the scope, what's in and what's out. Now generally on this area, are you, are you going to use the relative reception centre? Are you going to use um, family reunite? You know, you're going to reunite your family? Those are the type of things. So you look at your AEP and go, yes, I'm going to exercise this part, but not this part. Um, and you start defining those in your exercise plan so it's nice and clear to the people who are going to participate in that exercise what they're going to be exercising and to make sure that people aren't going to set up those other facilities when they're out of scope for your exercise. Now I want to go back and look at the aim um, and I think it's important to, to look at the aim of an exercise. And really an exercise is the development or replication of a situation, event, crisis or series of these to discuss, develop or practice, test and validate your people and your business, state of readiness and the ability to take necessary actions in responding to and recovering from the challenges presented within the exercise scenario. So generally on your aim, it can be either that you're validating your AEP, you're training your staff, Really, if you're drilling, you're starting to test um, certain areas. But you also want to make sure, and, and it's clear, that the purpose of your exercise plan is to train and validate. I think they're the key ones. But sometimes if you start putting that you're testing your personnel, um, people start getting nervous. The next part of your exercise plan, you look at your legislation, references, Participants, roles and responsibility. So I'll go back to legislation. Now on the right hand side I've used some examples there um, of the types of legislation that you can include. Now really legislation are your rules of engagement. You want to know who can do what and when legally. Um, now this is a good one to start asking the question. A lot of people either leave out legislation totally in their exercise plan or don't discuss it in their planning. And this is an important area to make sure that when you're planning an exercise, you understand what are the requirements from your responding agencies. And it's a good one for an objective to include, rules of engagement of your um, responding agencies. Now the references, you can have documents that will assist you in your exercises. So for example, safety data sheets, information that might help you with your risk assessment process as well. Now with your participants, you want to confirm early that they're available. A lot of the times, ambulance in particular, uh, find it hard to come to exercises because they, they've got limited resources and they're responding to a real issue many times. But if you get in early, most of the time they will be able to uh, plan ahead. So making sure that they're available and then going back to what's in and out of scope, if there are participants who can't um, participate, put them out of scope in your document. Then roles and responsibilities. Um, now for most of these ones in an exercise plan, I'll put the roles and responsibilities of your key staff. So your exercise director, who will have exercise oversight. Um, your exercise planning committee, because you'll be planning the, the exercise. And then you look at all of the operational areas. You will have exercise control, participants, evaluators and role players. They're the key ones that I look at um, and would include in an exercise plan. Then you need to come up with an exercise name, the exercise type. Now the exercise type, you're running a tabletop, full field or just a drill. Um, and then your scenario. 
your general and your special ideas. So as a general one, you would come up with an example crash on airport. After that, you start injecting special ideas, such as you've got some previous intelligence, you've had a bomb threat, you've got people rushing to the airport. So start looking at the key things that you want to um, address. And the purpose of this is that you can start building your master schedule of events, which I'll go on to after. But before that, some tips for when you're looking at your special events or your special ideas. You want to inject scenarios that cover all aspects of your emergency response. You want to make sure that there's an incident where you can save lives, something that will stabilise the scene. You want to have something where you're going to be saving property, the environment. You also want to start looking at how you're going to recover from this incident um, and restoring the airport operations. You may have airlines who are saying, okay, I've got, um, I want my aircraft inbound. What's going on? When will you be back on board? And you also want to make sure that people preserve the accident scene, but put that into um, your special index so you will be reminded that you have to cover those type of things off. But make sure the scenario is realistic and always find a way to introduce chaos and common failures likely in a real incident. Now this ends up going into, you can call it a program of activities or a master schedule of events. So in this area, you want to do who, when, where and what. So you're looking at, um, you can set this up in a table, so at nine o'clock, Someone's going to do this, when they're going to do it, where they're going to do it, and uh, what's happening. You don't really need to answer the question why. That's done in a post-accident investigation. But generally, this starts up your master schedule of events. So when you're moving through your, um, your exercise, people will know what's coming next. And one that I've missed, but I think you would be pertinent to include in, a, in an exercise plan, is the exercise conduct. So exercise activation, who's going to activate the, is it going to be your air trafficker, it's going to be your aerodrome reporting officer, are you going to have a pilot calling in that they've got um, some issue. And then you need to include the timing, you're going to do four hours for an emergency exercise and what's going to indicate when you're going to complete the exercise. It's a good one to include in an exercise plan so everyone is aware of the logistics of it. Now going back to exercise control, and this is another section of the exercise plan that covers off to make sure you think about these things. So here your exercise directing staff are, their appointment and responsibilities. Now I'm, I would include this up the front of the document, um, but you can also look at who will do your briefings, which is the next one, and I'll cover off briefings shortly. Um, any extra documentation, your communication. Now communication can be a whole plan in itself, how you're going to communicate about the exercise, who's going to do your media releases, um, and who's going to communicate if you have an issue during your exercise. You need to look at all your safety and security, and this will come out generally through your risk assessment process. Um, you need to look at how you're going to manage your media and any visitors during that time or observers and your exercise termination and your exit strategy. Um, now, two things, if a real event happens and the no duff situation explain no duff, a lot of people aren't aware of what no duff means. Um, and if so, if something happens for real or you end up the finish your exercise, how do you tell all your participants? Because no doubt they'll be spread across your airport. And then key to um, running an exercise, and we go into the next part of conducting the exercise, debriefing and evaluating your exercise. So in an exercise evaluation, you want to make sure that you have a purpose of the evaluation. Um, people need to understand what the process is. Do you have a set form that you're going to use? How that's going to be fed back to the people? You're also going to look at uh, exercise debrief, uh, exercise reporting. So. In your exercise plan, you'll state that two weeks after the exercise, an exercise report will be submitted to the committee for consideration. Then you also make sure uh, you look at your administration. The cost, you know, you're going to have things like um, extra equipment, you might have some catering, 
um, all the logistical requirements, your travel and accommodation, you may need to bring some people in. Um, and catering can also be a part of your logistics. So a bit of a double up on that one. But important to think about. And I think it's really pertinent to come up with a checklist. This makes sure that you remember all the things that you need to do. And some of these that I would give tips for is listing your facilities that you're required. So if you're going to use your relative reception centre and find that actually it's a church off airport, you need to make sure that you know, a playgroup hasn't booked that facility for that particular day. So check that availability and book all of those in. Test your communications. Now, some airports you will get some, um, you know, some dead spots for mobile phones, and you'll also need to check your radio frequency. If you, if it's a security exercise, making sure that people are on secured networks as well. You also want to define your observer area, making sure that they have shade, um, chairs available, water, all those type of things, especially if it's a longer exercise. And how are you going to move those observers around? Uh, especially if they want to observe different areas of your exercise. Always look at catering and toilets, even for a short exercise. Always put in where your toilet facilities are. Um, and if, it's, if you need to make sure that you've got someone um, escorting those personnel, make sure that you have that in your checklist. Another tip is maybe putting up exercise and progress signs um, around the facility so people are aware of what's going on. And also your smoke machine. So I've used that uh, example on the left from Darwin International Airport. So a smoke machine is fantastic for people to understand, okay, where are the wind conditions? Where is this going to? So it, can, uh, it simulates some real activity to make it easier for people to understand what would really happen if this caught on fire. Also look at where you're going to get your volunteers from. How many do you need? And where will you resource them? And you often need to plan this well in advance. Um, you also need to look at your aircraft, what will you use? Also your CCT coverage. So if anything happens, if you have an incident during that exercise, making sure that um, you'll make, you can have that CCT coverage. Uh, and someone would be good to monitor that if you do have that. You know, the best thing as well is a photographer and, a, um, and someone even to video your uh, exercise. So you can provide that in the debrief at the end and also um, in your report and it's a visible cue of what went right um, or things that need to be lesson, lessons learned. The great one from Newman Airport, um, they recently just had their exercise and they put an ad up on their website looking for some volunteers. So just a, a tip, always check out what everyone else is doing and share your ideas. Um, a good one from them. Our top one from uh, Grid Island who got their um, aircraft wings made up and then they just drive their bus through. Um, so a great idea from continuing to have exercises. You can increase your bus size um, based on the amount of people that you're working with. And also don't forget about the airlines um, or their ground handlers. Often they will have emergency kits, so also get them to do their checklist. What toys I have available if you've got kids on board and they're coming back in, they're going to be in your terminal for quite some time. What sort of activities can you have for the people there? Any interpreters, uh, especially if you're, um, you know, you may possibly have an aircraft inbound uh, that you're not uh, used to have. Um, and also blankets for those chilly nights um, and equipment for transporting the injured. A lot of time they have some great equipment that can move people from the incident back to the terminal or to assist the ambulance. So always check what equipment they've got and include it in your plan. And the briefings that should be covered. Um, make sure that your exercise control and your exercise safety officer, make sure people know who your exercise safety officer is. Really highlight that person, give them a special tab out to wear. Um, Make sure your role players are instructed what they need to do. Come up with, um, you can have a card written out for them, but also you need to make sure that they're well aware of their safety requirements. Um, I've had a few people who've been actually put in the clinker <laughs> during the exercise because they sort of overplayed their role. Um, also make sure that your evaluators know where they're to, what part of the exercise they're going to evaluate, what forms they need to have. 
So if you're observers, where, how, and you're going to move them around. Any exercise participants, this includes all your emergency responders. Um, so your health services, you may give them the casualty plan during the exercise, so just make sure that they're aware of that. Then have a generic safety instruction and include a site brief. Now, this could trigger PTSD for some people, um, or it might just be something that uh, making sure that if someone trips over, what happens, who do they need to talk to, um, and the no duff situation. Now the risk assessment. Um, okay, Redback, can you please put up the poll? Okay, so for the poll, I've put, does your airport conduct risk assessments as part of the exercise planning? Fantastic. On this one, there is 100% of people saying yes. So this is a fantastic outcome because this is a key area of an exercise plan. So I'll go back to the presentation. So why conduct a risk assessment? I'm preaching to the converted here. It identifies the risk and can pick up gaps in your planning, and that's a key one. That sometimes when you're assessing the risk, you go, oh, geez, we forgot about that part. Um, Make sure you use your company risk assessment process. Uh, ensure it meets Australian standards, uh, first of all, before you use that. Uh, and it's a group effort. So your emergency committee or your exercise planning team, it can't be, for example, I do one, it can't be the world according to Jill. It has to be involved in your planning committee. So everyone will see something different that you won't see. Uh, and I've used like Sydney Airport, that was one of their exercises. I uh, can imagine the risk assessment on that part, um, quite a detailed exercise there. Key things, I'm not sure what people are currently using in a risk assessment, but these are the key things or key areas um, that I use in my risk assessment. So your workplace health safety and welfare. Um, so that's of, you know, you do your checks on your workplace health safety of your site. So flip trips, falls, all those type of things, lighting for night time. Um, and also then for your participants, um, uh, is everyone able bodied? Is everyone able to get to these areas? Um, those type of things that you'll need to consider. The human resources, who can and can't um, participate, some of the issues that can go around uh, the resourcing. Someone may not be able to turn up on the day, um, which is often a risk and then how you'll deal with that. So make sure you understand how you'll do that. The venues, your assets and resources. If there's any damage, someone drives into one of your open lights um, or one of the equipment there, how will that be dealt with? Your physical security, and then making sure that anything that comes out of this risk assessment goes into your briefings. Uh, any contingency planning uh, for if you have a major storm come through, are we gonna keep going? Do we stop the exercise? Government and community relations. Now these type of things, if you've got, uh, say you're doing an active armed defender exercise and you make the, the, the person maybe of Middle Eastern descent, so that would not go well in, um, in some of your community relations. So just have those things, thoughts in mind when you're doing those risks. Your environment and weather. Um, you know, certainly uh, some airfields are quite challenging to for emergency responders um, to get their vehicles out to. So if it's rained the day before, you've got a boggy surface, how are you going to deal with that? Make sure that you've included that. Not in any exercise planning and management. Um, people can't turn up to the meetings, um, those things to consider. A big one is also composite fibres. Um, and even though, you know, in a real incident, you'll be dealing with that. So just make sure that that's covered off of, you know, have people done the training in that area. Now, ATSB, and I think they've just recently, as of yesterday, put out some new things on hazards at aviation accident sites. So um, not a, a fully abreast of what those changes are, but just keep an eye on ATSB and the materials that they have available for them, from them, and are good ones to use and also to hand out during your planning of the exercise. 
And there's a fantastic little one called International Air Transport Association, or ARTA. Most people um, will already know that one. Aviation Crisis Communications and Social Media Guidelines. It's a free download and a really good one that you can use during your uh, planning to say, hey, um, we're going to have people probably taking some photos and things. Let's set up some guidelines. And so have a look at that one to see if that can assist you in any way. And lastly, um, some great people to work with. Um, as I make sure you get people involved early and committed. Make it fun. Um, make it worthwhile for all the agencies so they come back. And practice makes permanent. Um, if you want people skilled in the process, they have to become efficient. Uh, the intense scrutiny that follows an incident provides powerful motivation for responders to be good at, um, at a response. So thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, queries or doubtful points, can you please put them up in on the questions and I'll, well, let's see how we can go with answering them. Okay, I have a question from Dale. Not a question, but more of a comment. We wind direction. Found we had to add a table on all of our plans showing wind directions from airport perspective, 270 degrees at 10 knots, LEMC groups, so the police, local bush fire brigade, um, from the west to east at 10 knots, and that was done from the mine emergency services officers, and westerly can cause confusion during a response, especially if fire is involved. And have I come across this before? Most of the time I've found that people actually don't consider wind enough. Um, so Daryl, you're probably lucky that people are considering it. Um, maybe you're in a bushfire zone and they're much more um, needing to look at that. Uh, but really good point and maybe something that we can look at um, in our AAA emergency committee. I also um, forgot to add about that one right at the beginning, but we do have a AAA emergency committee and uh, something that we can start looking at together as a group. Um, Sam says, just to clarify, under the new MOS regulations, based on a proposed risk-related criteria that reflect the aircraft and passenger movement activity, emergency exercise would be removed for some existing certified airports and replaced with emergency preparedness, airside inductions and familiarity programs. Yeah, um, I have to agree with the, um, there is changes uh, in terms of that, but you also, um, this is one of the reasons why I've put up all the legislation. It's not just MOST. Always don't just look at your MOST requirements. Yes, FASA may be the one to need to look at those documents when you do those exercises, but you also have a due diligence process um, and you also have to do under your workplace health and safety to cover that off as well. Um, so I would still recommend that you do that and or if the requirement is that you do it with your local or district emergency committees, make sure that they involve the airport a lot more. Otherwise you get left behind. Um, I hope I've answered that well enough Dan, but um, you can always contact me as well. Um, Daryl was asked, might have missed it, but can you expand on the use of logs? Um, so maybe you use this in more of the master schedule of events. So you can log all your events that you want, or there's two types of logs. Logging your event as it actually happens, and that's a requirement. Really, people should be logging their own events, especially for post-incident review. Um, and you'll know that, okay, at this time, this is what I've done. There's also, in your planning phase, a master schedule event where you, you determine at these particular times you want these events to happen. So you'll log that in a master schedule event. So separate to real and uh, what you're planning. Uh, again, I might have to get you to give me a call on that one, Daryl. Yesterday, ATSB launched the Guide for Airports for Working with the ATSB, available online. Thank you, Matthew. That's really good because um, uh, yeah, it's good to see that people are looking and seeing how to do this all the time. Um, especially uh, one of the things that I've put in there is the inject is making sure you're looking at um, if you do have a crash or any type of incident that you're not making uh, a problem and actually trampling over the evidence. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're doing the planning. 
Okay, I can't see any further questions. Um, I'll just give you another minute if there is any more. I'll just go back to my presentation. So I've got my details there. Um, always free to give me a call or an email. Um, and also uh, would love your contribution to our national committee. Um, so if you do have any lessons learnt, um, if you could bring that up, I'm chairing that committee. We have a meeting um, on the 31st or the 30th. And um, so we can share our learning to improve the state of affairs in Australia. So no more questions have come in. Um, so I'll give it back to Redback. Thank you very much for everyone for listening. Thank you, Jill, for providing an informative presentation. Thank you also to everyone for participating in today's session. We ask that you now take a moment to complete a short survey that you will be redirected to shortly. Today's webinar recording will be available in Airport Alert and email to everyone directly once available. We encourage you to provide feedback on any other topics that you would like to see covered by emailing events at airports.asn.au. The next Airport Safety Week webinar is this Thursday, 17th of October, presented by Tom Griffiths on the topic of safety management systems. Please refer to the Airport Safety Week emails to register for this webinar. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.